Good evening and a warm welcome to this evening's virtual event, Restoration, Regulation and Reinvention, which we at Druitt are delighted to bring to you with our co-host Savills. Working with collections and clients is always exciting and it's a privileged relationship. But when those collections are as dynamic as here at Ainho, and when the collectors are as brave as James and Sophie Perkins, it's unmissable. The energy, the creativity that goes into building these collections, managing them, handing them on, and creating a brand, as well as the architectural elements of housing it, is an enormous project. And it's multi-layered and takes many skills. So today we're very, very lucky to have three leading exponents in Ian Abel, James and Sophie Perkins, and Thomas Heatherwick. So I hope we're all gonna learn, I know we're all gonna learn an awful lot this evening about what it takes and some of the characteristics that come out of it and the creativity. So thank you for joining us. And I'll hand over to Crispin from Savills, our co-host, to say a few words. Many thanks. I'm Crispin Holdra. For 34 years, I've been dealing with the sale of gorgeous country houses for Savills. And I've probably now driven through more of their gates than anyone else currently working in the industry. So I know my way around the block. But what never fails to fascinate me is what comes later after I've sold the property. As the patron, the architect and the designer come together to create their magic and transform the sometimes very tired interiors of these architectural gems, I know I can never do it myself. We've got a market right now which is super active, more so than for many years. And so it's highly relevant to understand the alchemy of design, which is what's going to be discussed tonight. So a warm welcome from Savills and over to Carol. To our panel discussion on creating a country house for today. I'm Carol Annett and delighted to be joined by Sophie and James Perkins of Ain Ho and Pine. Thomas Heatherwick, founder of Heatherwick Studio and Ian Abel of Based Upon. Thank you for joining us everybody. Um, James, I wanted to start with you. Um, so you've been at Ain Ho almost 16 years now, um, known as how Downton meets Wonderland. Um, Tell us a bit about your original vision for Ainho and why you think it was been such a success. Well, from the childhood I had, um, when I think about Mr. Ben, which was very much a cartoon about anything can be possible in your life, which is, at, at the time I didn't think it was possible I could be any one of these people, certainly not living in a grand country house. I think that combined with Batman, James Bond, and um, if you like Indiana Jones and, you know, even Highlander, there's lots of asset aspects of that and characters which were quite fantastical and um, magical and included very contemporary architecture where I was just like in total awe of the character, the place they lived. And it was the best of the best and the most beautiful people and the most fun and the most best cars and everything. And so, of course, as a young boy, you're gonna, always going to aspire to something like that. So one day... When I was in the music industry in Miami, I um, was staying in a hotel that was like the coolest hotel in America at the time, which I didn't know it was the coolest hotel. I'd just been invited to go for a meeting for a Miami music conference. And I just ended up staying in this hotel for six months. And I was trying to work out what it was that made it so special. Was it the staff? Was it the look? Was it the fact that it looked nothing like a hotel? 
So you just felt like you were in a movie set. And it was the scale too. It was so many aspects and of course the weather. And um, I no longer felt like I was in my parents' hotel or a hotel that my parents would go to. I felt like I was in a bit of a dream. And I thought, well, actually, I love architecture. I've been cycling around my bicycle since the age of 12, taking pictures of houses, but not really quite sure why. But knowing one thing for sure, I couldn't afford one. And I decided I was going to work really hard and um, one day have a country house. And much like the movie Arthur, I wanted a butler. I wanted the Rolls Royce. You know, <laughs> I wanted a bit of that eccentricity that went with it. And, um, you know, maybe a glass of wine too. Anyway, the, the point was um, I wanted to build our own eccentric, whimsical place, uh, a wonderland of, of – wonderland and, if you like, a brain dump of ideas – of everything that was going on in my head, but trying to blend everything I knew from the music industry, blend it in with my knowledge of antiques and architecture. And could that be done? Well, I felt it could be done because I was passionate about all of these subjects. And, and this is the culmination of what you get. And I think it's something that appeals to young and old, but it's whimsical, it's fun, it's intriguing. And um, I think that's probably one of the reasons why we've got such a good, good following. Yeah, well, and it's I've obviously had. given it's obviously given you guys a lot of pleasure as well. Um, Sophie, what about the taste making branch of the business? A grand modern tour. I know you've been heavily involved in that. How does that play its part? Well, our modern grand tour stemmed from the success of the previous auction that we did, um, and obviously it was when that when that was such a success, it meant that every um, there was a validation of the look of um, Ainho and and people really sort of bought into that look and wanted to create it at home. So, um, and it was also um, a reason for James to do some more buying and um, an outlet for that. So that's, I basically um, started the business um, of creating a moderngrandtour.com so people could have a resource for the unusual. And also we were getting asked a lot, where do we get stuff from? How can we get this? You know, I would like a flying giraffe, but not that big. Or, you know, how do, how do, um, do I have to just have a zebra, a rocking horse? Can we have something else? So um, that's where Modern Grand Tour stemmed from. Um, and Ian, I wanted to ask you, because you've collaborated with James on a couple of specific pieces at Ainho. Tell us about your involvement and, and how you came to work together. We were originally introduced by a friend and I, I came to the house when it was it was still in the state in which pretty much in which James had, had found it. Some of that main central space in the salon um, had been tidied up so it was habitable. But I remember I, I remember us being in there, Ian. I remember us meeting there too, <laughs> like that. When it was still when it was just painted and there wasn't really much there wasn't he hadn't bought so much yet and there and there was still a vision going on wasn't there yeah and and i remember standing outside out the back and looking out over the over the landscape and him explaining his vision for it and that sense of possibility that he described that that which a lot you know he described being a child and saying so you know i watched all of these films and i thought well why can't i have that Clearly, a lot of us are, are worn down by the trials of life and we lose some of that enthusiasm and that belief that anything's possible. But, but James held it in a way that was, was credible and believable and, as I say, infectious. And he described to me that he wanted not only to, to create a property which would be impressive, but an environment which would bring people together, would attract interesting people and that they would meet there and they would spark ideas and he wanted to observe what would happen if you took these diverse characters and gave them an environment in which they could clearly play and be entertained but also think and and dream and when we, we we've had many conversations uh, over the years and, and and tried a number of different things the the fragmented crack bronze piece which is in the library is is is, is my favorite piece that that he has there, and it and it was, it, it, it was brought into into life. We we'd originally dreamed it in uh, we were in the jungle in Uganda on a, on a commissioned work telling the story of a family, and we passed by a cracked mud house, which we stopped and started taking casts from, 
and uh, I was sharing this with James and explained that we wanted to make it in in bronze, but the you know clearly the investment of making such a large work in bronze, especially for us at the time, we were in our infancy at Based Upon, and he said, well, let's do it, let's let's do that together, let's bring it to life, and wouldn't it look fabulous in the in the library? And um, I think there's another piece of yours, the the British Isles. Just give us a quick um, a quick overview of that one. Yeah, that sits above the above the uh, fire in the main uh, in the entrance hall to Ainho. And and again, that was there was a series of work that we'd originally made on the idea of creative surrender and what it means to create form just by the act of discarding. So that series is made by by discarding paper and then and then working from what's what remains and. Uh, we made it originally uh, on for a show that we did in the Middle East, uh, and uh, James said, "Well, what if what if we bring that series and do do a version for for the British Isles?" And again, it would kind of sum up the the, the whimsy that we talked about and the playfulness, but also the kind of iconic heritage that we of, of, of brand Britain that we associate with Ainhoe. So but it's I, actually it, yeah, absolutely, Sophie. Go on. I was gonna. I was just gonna say. I think that the piece is really important um, to have the Great British Isles um, because it was so traditional for people that owned country houses in England to go uh, to go on these grand tours. Going back to why we called it, you know, the modern grand tour, because James and I are doing our grand tour. We, we've the why the reason of these all these eccentric pieces around the house is because we're bringing all of these thoughts and ideas and um artwork from around the world and bringing it back and that was and that's and even though it's um eccentric it's whimsical it's still a kind of tradition that was there and i think that's important um for us is to go back to our heritage and be you know british yeah and i i think it's um it's also really interesting having um being a almost like a sort of patron of the arts and nurturing nurturing the artists i think there's very much um an idea that you know these things might, may not have happened if if you james and sophie hadn't been there to um to allow to sort of give them a space and give them a voice i also wanted to ask you about the fashion houses and the events you had there sophie tell us a, a little bit about people that you've had there I mean, we've been so lucky. Um, we've had everyone from, you know, we've had Mario Testino taking pictures. We've had um, Kate Moss. We've had um, Jimmy Chu, Matthew Williamson, Gucci. I mean, I, the list is completely endless of fashion houses, and we've been so proud, you know, and also amazing, photo you know, the amazing photographers that have chosen to use us as a, a backdrop for their campaigns or, you know, as a mood board, you know, I think um, going back to what Ian said, it's it's kind of a place where people can use it as a, um, a think space and um, and putting so many different things against each other and the juxtaposition of things. So I think that makes people really think about um, how and why and when. So yeah, that's yeah, why I think we'd be it's very very clever. clever. That as you're saying, and as it, the theme that's coming through is that is the idea that anything's possible. And to, to, Thomas, I'm sure you experience a lot when we're, when we're asked to do things and, and there's a patron involved or, or a company or a developer or a city or whoever's paying for it, a committee ends up filtering down the ideas and, and often, and often your, your vision as, as artist or, or designer is tempered um, as, um, they, as they seek to appease all of the people with an interest. And, What's interesting in working with working with James is clearly there's, there's none of that because his his aspiration is to to create that which which ought not to be possible, and uh, there's like a flying giraffe for those that come to the house to, uh, to either to sorry James to cook, uh, either to party oh, no, or, no. or to yeah. use it for a shoot or whatever they, they they buy into that idea and it allows them to be more ambitious and expressive and and playful, escapism um, than we get used to yeah. It, it's. I think it's also that idea um, of the the grand country house as it used to be of bringing you're bringing people together and 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 talking and ideas and and all that kind of thing. Thomas, have you had any experience of Ainho or because I know you're heavily involved with Parnham, the new project, but did you have a chance mm. to go to Ainho as well? Yeah, um, it seemed the 
natural extension of how James and I met when um, James came to my studio. And I think that where we connected, we haven't really discussed this, James, but was around plaster. And uh, this is sort of a, a funny one because I've been really interested in plaster casting because plaster is inherently an inexpensive material and the also much architecture in stucco in effect as versions of plaster and in the work that we've been doing in the studio and trying to push was trying to bring emotion back into architecture it felt that a real mistake was made um, in the modern movement which was uh, a sort of functionalist mindset that forgot that emotion was a function and so i felt that James and I connected in the plaster inexpensively takes form and makes shadow and makes interest if you use molds. And I think James, you had, had relatively recently bought the, when the Victorian Albert Museum uh, got rid of a whole lot of the duplicates they had of their plaster collection. I think it was the yeah, biggest honest, ever yeah. uh, collection. And it was an amazing set of which was all about form and it felt that the modern movement in architecture and the cities we've grown up in and around with the new parts which are all flat they're all two-dimensional and they've lost the emotional engagement that form can give you and detail and interest and so i think we'd done a, a some experiments in the studio with casting the the phone bot the the letterbox around the the corner from the studio and James you were like a sniffer dog in the studio I mean we've got lots of <laughs> things that we've collected and you just sort of honed in on that and we connected and then you you went home afterwards and I felt we really sort of bonded and then a gigantic plaster ram arrived at the studio a few days later which sits on our wall still now in fact I should have positioned myself in front of it and when I came to Ainho there was the the bat cave that I experienced was the casting with was uh, a couple of incredible craftsmen who were working with James and um, mold making casting and the the simplicity of a material that is open to whatever form you're going to give it but it, it the preciousness is in the ideas you put onto that material and yeah. um, and so it's lovely now to be working on a on an architectural project together in, and we've, we've had all sorts of discussions over, over the years we've known each other and now to be working with a, a place that I knew growing up um, in my training as a place that was about use of timber and sustainability and craftsmanship and ideas and how you don't just let uh, an amazing house like that vanish, vanish into a single banker's ownership but actually how you make something like that really be opened up to many people and, and offered and, and giving a public dimension properly back somehow using these incredible resources that we're so blessed to have in this country, these, these, uh, these stately homes that you can either be one person's or they can be shared by different people and overlapped and maximized. And, and my interest is how you create access. Absolutely. We're just going to have um, a little flavor of Parnham Park um, and put it into context. And afterwards, James, perhaps you could give us a, a, a quick overview of why you fell in love with Parnham. Of course. For, for Sophie and I, when we went down there the first time, I'm not sure we fell in love with the with the journey. We felt it was a bit far away, a lot of traffic that day, and we didn't really know where we were in the country. And um, 
I sort of dismissed it. I went, look, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't right. And then I thought about it, and then I went to a place called the Newt that had opened, and then I said, oh, how far is that away from um, Bearminster? And um, before I know it, I thought, it's only 40 minutes away. Oh, my God, there's lots of investment in this area. And, and then I started thinking about Cornwall, which I've not really visited. And then I said, let's go back. Let's go back to this place, because I rang the agent, and they said, look, um, guess it's best bids by Tuesday. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's in 48 hours. So let me go back and have another look. And then I thought, this is a bit of an opportunity, actually. This is an opportunity to have Aino by the sea. <clears throat> a complete retreat from the normal world. Yes, it's another hour further than I would normally like to go, but actually, in order to enjoy that lack of light pollution and damage that you get that the light causes, where you don't get to see the most wonderful astrology and, and stars in the sky, unless you go overseas, um, I just felt, oh, it's an opportunity, and, and what an opportunity to, to, to put, an, put a modern intervention into a grade one listed house and to have a, a wall garden restaurant perhaps, and to have some most fantastic tree houses, and to be able to reopen the deer park, and to have water around. Water's very important to me, you know, I'm really always, always drawn to, to the water and the sea. And I had this amazing lake, and it felt very swallows and Amazons. And, and when I first, we both left, and I felt the best word to describe it was overwhelming. And we're talking about a house with no roof, of course. Still it's overwhelmed gonna... now, actually. And it is overwhelming. <laughs> Just the magic of nature is so special. And when we when we were there, it was a bit like the, the is it called the secret garden? And that's what it felt like. And I felt like it was like we were in a movie set. And I yeah. could see just that dreamlike, magical love and care and attention that had gone into the gardens and, the, and, 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 and this house for five, six hundred years. Just resonated with me and felt that like it needed our assistance <laughs> and and i felt that you know, not, not wishing to be daunted by the size of the project i sort of felt that well i've got the experience because i'm gray now and i've got and i've and i've got more ideas and we've just completed aino park and we just sort of agreed potentially a deal on aino at the time and i thought is this biting off more than I can chew. No, I think we can do this. And met some wonderful people. And um, I'm sure Sophie would like to say a few words at this point. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was a white owl that flew over. And there were just all sorts of magical things that happened in the space of a couple of hours. And I was enchanted to come back. So just before this dreaded coronavirus came about, we were probably the last property deal to take place in England. Is and Sophie, did you fall in love? What am I doing? <laughs> I Did you fall in love with quickly, James? I think that what happened was both, as James mentioned, is that we both came and saw it, and it, it was a bit overwhelming at first, and we kind of disregarded it, and we went and saw um, another property, and then when we came back again, I think that that sort of something came, that something that day happened that was so magical. I don't know. the The sun was beaming, and and we were walking, as James said, we were walking around the lake, and it just felt like we were at home and it just felt like oh and that pull and then I didn't I couldn't I just couldn't stop thinking about the house um after that um visit and I would say to J I would tell James all about like every week like you know come come can we think about Parnham I've got so many ideas and I go to bed dreaming about Parnham I think that for, about Parnham is um it's it's the next chapter for us and we want to bring that whimsical element that we had at Ainho down here, but it's it's a different house. It's 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 so much more about nature now. It's it's incorporating that, and and also we want it to be much more about the children and and I think for everybody, coronavirus in whatever way has made us realise what's really important. So yes, yeah, spending time with the kids and being family orientated and and you know and learning and that's really a big part of what we want to do and and um and skills and stuff so we that's we want to bring all those elements now into Parnham um and Thomas you you touched a little bit earlier on um John Makepeace can you could you go a little bit further into that and his the the sort of um because he had quite a um 
a residence down in the, in that same area. And I also wanted to ask you about your own projects, um, about creating something modern without losing the essence of history, which um, you know brings to mind lots of the things that you've done at the Bombay Sapphire Distillery in Laverstock, Coldrops Yard. I mean, that's very much kind of your you're in your element at Parnham, I'm assuming. Mm. Well, the, there was a, a tragedy in that this house got burnt down and, and it seems that our, our role and together is to heal it and, and to make good the tragedy and turn it into something that is really um, wholesome going forward. And there, there are the sort of pockets of craftsmanship all around Britain that have their roots there. And John Makepeace, in a sense, in the world of craft is quite legendary because his level of craft was so exceptional. The pieces made by him, when you came across them uh, at, um, like at the Crafts Council, they were the most phenomenal pieces of making that you couldn't even work out how anyone could have made. Mm. And there was a person who wasn't just a designer in their own right and craftsman, they were also creating a college to, to train many other people. And so I've worked with people who trained at Parnham College and they, uh, they, they all spoke very highly of this exceptional place. And John Makepeace also then went on to set up somewhere called Hook Park nearby, taking from the furniture scale to the architectural scale, looking at how you could use the forest thinnings rather than necessarily having to take down all the main trees to create uh, building techniques and materials using those thinnings. And at one point I was very inspired. He, he was saying, well, imagine if you'd made the Millennium Dome using forest thinnings. And I just love the amb crazy ambition of that. <laughs> and the architectural association took mm -hmm. over the Hook Park and it's just around the corner. So when James rang me and we had our first conversation, I was just immediately saying, look, there's an, a, a wonderful heritage, not just in the house itself, but in the whole area and, and an excuse to create a much bigger story than restoring a lovely a, a house, a house back to loveliness. And so we've been having some amazing meetings with the planners and uh, with James and Sophie and the team growing, growing the ideas in this. But I, I when I trained and started designing buildings, I suppose I was always imagining that it was going to be about creating new buildings. And then I got interested in soulfulness and how new things so rarely ever had something that really got you in your stomach. There might be a shape that looked good in a postcard of a building you went to see, but something that really moved you. and. When we got to work in South Africa, for example, with this century old grain silo that had been the tallest building in sub-Saharan Africa for half a century, to, to figure out what do you do with a giant concrete structure made from tubes? How could we turn that into the continent's first major institution for African artists to show their work? I, that and then working with Bombay Sapphire to create a distillery from the derelict paper mill buildings in Hampshire. I realized that these were all blessings. We were blessed to use these old structures because they oozed character and spirit. And so our, our job really was to sort of steer with that. Most of our work was actually trying to amplify the texture and personality of what existed there already. And even though someone might think, oh, what well, all we did was that atrium or what we did was those glass houses. For example, at Laverstoke, most of our work was amplifying the existing buildings, bringing them back to life, but also widening the river, for example. We tripled the width of the river, which was the purest river in Britain, the River Test going through the middle. So I'm aware also with, with Parnham, the landscape, as James described, this amazing landscape. And where landscape and building begin and end and interface with each other. I think the idea that you have a house and the landscape around is like garnish on a dinner plate. It's a sort of old 
mindset somehow rather than mm. how do you bring the landscape alive how do you bring people into that landscape and i think that the covid crisis is is a huge challenge for us now because it's in the role of cities what are they for because you used to be tethered to the city because you were tethered yeah. to the job which was tethered to the heart of a city and once that there is now the real possibility of maybe not being five days a week in a workplace but maybe two or three suddenly the the majority of your life being in a city can shift to why does the majority of your life have to be there rather than yeah. the minority of your life so i think we're going to see a really interesting time where incredible people incredible energy goes into the broader country distributes away in a permanent sense from the cities and it's moving around the country so the these phenomenal houses are an excuse for not just a place that people drive on friday nights and leave back on sunday nights for lots of driving but real places mm -hmm. where teams can come together do incredible work together come up with the ideas and maybe cities are bigger convening places but then these these homes can be can create amazing convening places more which feels the spirit of how they were really created or should have been originally when they weren't when they were bustling places with many many people interacting there um, yeah. we don't need staff and servants in the same way so why not instead of it being serving staff it's people coming together for extraordinary uh humanity doing what it does best which is having ideas together yeah um, um, so Ian, yeah, I the different to... projects I, I i won't go into all of my projects because it will never come off the line otherwise <laughs> Um, Ian, I just wanted to bring you in here because um, we're talking about, with Thomas talking about um, rice, brought to mind your grain of rice, um, that very sort of elemental beauty of your your work. Talk to us a, a little bit about that and and whether what Thomas was saying resonates with the how the way that you work. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I always when commissioned to do something, I always look for that essence that's at the core. And I think it's exciting if somebody's privileged enough to be able to commission a work of art or a, or a piece of furniture, um, that, that we, we should honor that in return and, 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 and offer them the opportunity to make it about them or to come from them somehow and tell or tell their story. Uh, so a lot of our work begins with that. And the, the, the grain of rice commission was was commissioned uh, by a, a very large bank to, to mark 150 years of its history. And we knew that we wanted to create something because it was a public work. We wanted to create something that an, an average person walking on the street would enjoy. They can step inside it and it has a mirror polished core and the sound travels up and down it as you speak, as you enter it. But at the same time, it gave the, the, the bank an opportunity to mark this moment in time and honor the the key moments uh, of 150 years so the outer skin of this huge 10 meter high bronze actually is, is made up of really really fine engravings and it looks like you've fused together thousands upon thousands of old coins but then when you inspect the detail each one is part of that really detailed narrative of their of their story um, and there are and many 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 pieces um we begin in that way and i think it's that balance between sorry, why the grain why the of rice, rice? Uh, it came from it, there, there was there was a no, num, number of ang angles for the grain of rice um it was i was interested in it as kind of the kind of the lowest common denominator of something which could be traded you can imagine that a mountain of rice has a value but i imagine in history nobody's ever traded a single grain and i was thinking within within the notion of within the notion of banking you know what does that mean where something acquires a value, um, a commercial value? But it was then also, it was saying almost that in the East, because the, because it, it was for the bank, it, the bank was HSBC and they wanted to appeal very much to the East and the West. And it was saying that in the, that uh, somebody in the West may say, I'm okay, I've got a whole, whole mountain of rice here, you know, I'm well. Um, but the Eastern master would more say, well, actually, it's not about the mountain. It's about knowing each individual grain. And if you've got the focus and the acuity to see each individual grain, 
then you're likely to hold on to your mountain. Somebody who believes they have a mountain may be losing a grain every single day, which they would never see if they were losing it through a small, small uh, hole in the floor. And on that point, it was then saying that HSBC at 150 years is not the mountain of achievements it has, and it's not the buildings and the mergers and the money and all of the people, it's each individual grain that's represented it over that time. It's the people, it's the, it's the unknown, um, the unseen people. So we put out a brief to the whole company and said, you know, submit photographs of, the, of teams. And, and on that now, on that kind of monolithic sculpture that will be there for hundreds of years, um, it actually honors many of the faces of, of the unknown, the unknown people. Um, I love that idea of learning through a, a piece of art. And Sophie, I know that that's something that you really want to make Parnham a kind of centre of excellence. Tell us a bit about the artisan workshops and the things, the plans that you have for Parnham. I think that it's just going back to what everybody's talking about. It's craftsmanship and and sort of celebrating all of the um, the artisans that we have in this country and. Um, obviously, going back to what that John Makepeace had this house as a school, and so that's what we want to do. Is when people come to stay here, when people use Parnham, is that they come come here, and that there is an opportunity for them to learn a skill. Um, so, I mean, obviously, we're still working ideas out and um, and how this will work, but we use we use this with um, a modern grand tour. You know, we we make our own items with a modern grand tour too. And we use local artisans, we have a foundry, um, we have our own workshop, obviously, as, as Thomas mentioned earlier about the plaster, we have our own plaster workshop. And we also um, hand finish all of our um, feather lamps. We cut and um, hand dye and um, sort out all of the feathers so everything you know we are we really want to be best of british so we really want to promote that here that's the idea uh, and just moving on to our final section now which is looking at the broader perspective of the role of a country house in a modern changing world and landscape james tell us tell us a bit about your vision um, for Parnham as a as a modern country house. Well, I mean, it's going to be a modern country house because everything's going to be new inside the facade. I mean, you're <laughs> talking about it, the effects of the objects in the landscape, but once you look through the windows, you realise there's nothing there. So can you, we can are. Can you see that? There's the house. Pardon? There it just, is. Yeah, we, we can talk, just about, just about. Yeah, just about see the ruin in the background. But you know, yeah. it's a uh, you know, there's so much of the. Uh, elegant detailing and we, we, we sort of failed to mention John Nash now he's a pretty significant um, architect in our in our history you know responsible for Buckingham Palace and so many other important buildings and uh, you know I think that I'm pleased to have Thomas's involvement with that because I think it's we've got the best of British again and I think that you know much the same as I can't help thinking of myself with all the art pieces that I've created, like the flying giraffe and the rock and zebra and the moon painting and all of these pieces of eccentric ancestors. This is the chance to take perhaps some of my ideas, working with Thomas and his great team, to come up with something that's a, a future listed building for the future. And um, I can't help thinking it small ego way that it's if we can actually do something that is visited um, as, as a building that's going to be open to the public um, for, for private hires, much the same as Aino is, I think that we're going to inspire the next generation of architects and creatives, and we're going to definitely build a house where you know we'll be able to have an artist in residence that comes and stays for a month and then goes away, and then um, maybe we'll do an annual competition. But you know, it, it's something that would fill me with uh, with joy just to have these fascinating people around and feel that when people come to um, Parnham, they'll be immersed in the creative creativity at its very source. And are you working with historic houses or the National Trust or anything on this project? Actually, we are doing, um, we are in talks with the National Trust who are helping us with one aspect of the application, but we're working with Historic England, I think is who you mean. And Historic England have been, um, have been wonderful to be honest. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a real problem 
property and it's at the top of the buildings at this register and um i've got to say we've got a really good working relationship now nothing's ever straightforward at the start there's always a bit of a i'm not sure what's he got in mind this time um but i suppose the blend of all the people involved and the approach that we've made i hope it's going to be welcomed to the area because certainly dorset i want us to feel like we're like the gateway of creativity to that county and we build on what john makepeace did yeah. and, and and obviously even john nash and actually be something that everybody wants to visit rather than oh do you remember that place that that, that had that sad fire so i'm hoping that we can build on all the <clears throat> creativity that went into that house historically and you know was lost overnight really and um yeah, I think for certainly from the reception we've had down there, it's been pretty good. Yeah. And Sophie, I'm sure running a business that relies on sharing a private space can be challenging. Um, but has it had surprising <laughs> rewards James for is you? Smiling. At Ainhoe? <laughs> has it had surprising rewards at Ainhoe? And what are you hoping for at Parnham? I think that um of course, there's challenges of um, what I say sometimes is living above the shop. Um, but the rewards are way out. Um, maybe somebody walking in on you when you're in the shower or something, joking. Um, uh, it, it's, it's meeting people, like we said earlier. Um, it's the... It's the it's it's the experiences and it's the, the conversation and it's the learning that happens when you meet new people and um, who respect what you've done and want to talk about what they've done and and it and that is that's what I, I as we've just been talking about that's what's going to happen here at Parnham hopefully and yeah um, and Ian I wanted to ask you about the narrative on a on a piece because you you talk about art having to have a relevance in the future um you have a lovely quote on your website from ray bradbury about um when you having to leave something behind you whether it's a planting a garden or a tree or a wall that you've built and then when people look at that in the future that's you you're there it's very important to leave something behind Tell us about what, um, how you would see a piece of work at in a, an important house like Parnham. Well, I think Parnham and, and kind of sums that up in a way, right? Because we, we live, we live, we come, as we get older, we come to realize that we live very short lives and our lives are, are you know, if we, if we were to look from, from further out, we all, we all occupy the earth for a, for a very short space of time. And at the beginning, I think we believe we're perhaps more important than we are. And we believe that life was about evolving to this moment and we're somehow at the end of history. Um, and of course we're not, we're, 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 just, we're just here as a moment within, within the whole cycle. And we're seeing that now with, you know, what, what Jay, you can see the evolution of James's aspiration from having been a collector and enjoying acquiring things as we do in the first half of our life and building up the stuff that defines us, which might be what we do, or it might be what we own. And that's there as a dynamic for a lot of us. And then as we move over the arc into the second half of life, we start thinking, well, actually what, what will remain? Um, and clearly there's a huge aspect of, of legacy that will, will outlive you guys. What, you, what you're about to create at Parnham is, is going to live on for, for many many years and that that ch childful that childish kind of playfulness of the first half of your life of anything is possible is now being replaced by a more mature well what what will the what will the legacy be and that requires a different form of courage because you're committing to something here that's going to take a long time to build a long time to put in place and i think that sense of what does it mean to make something for the long term what does it mean to make something that i know that will outlive me um, is a really important idea right now because we live with a culture which is increasingly disposable, increasingly short term. Our content, our notion of materiality, everything, you know, the, the, the cycle is accelerating. And so when we get somebody saying, I'm going to take on a project here and I'll build and I'll build community and I'll and stimulate learning. And that will be where new ideas are born that will still be relevant in uh, over time. It's, 
it, it's it's very important, and I think that's clearly what what James is doing, um, and James and Sophie are doing on a very grand scale. It, it's there for for all of us, and uh, it's something that we all we, we we all we all think about, as I say, as we as we move over the arc into the second half of life. And Thomas, Tom, sorry, Sophie, go on. I said, uh, I just said that I think that's perfectly said. I think that was really lovely. Thomas, what about um, what I want to know is whether you are tempering all James's ideas or James is tempering yours or you're meeting your you're just your ideas are getting grander and grander and crazier and crazier. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I, I think, think there's no stopping these. Egging, <laughs> I think we're all egging each other on at the moment. And uh, what's exciting is that it's feeling like the, the, the planners in Dorset there and Historic England, they, they all recognise that there's, it, it's, it's cheesy if you just do some weird replication of something that's gone, that's long gone. And uh, but there's, this is a spirit that created that originally. And what matters is to go forward with a spirit that maybe meets the ambition of the spirit that created it originally. And so I think we're, we're exploring all sorts of ideas at the moment, but I think the there's an opportunity to transform the perception of houses like this, of what they're for, and why they exist. And I, and what's exciting for me is I don't know of anyone else taking the approach that uh, James and Sophie are, and so we feel very very lucky to be working with them. Well, I think that's very exciting. And just going back to something that you said earlier. Thomas about healing that I love the idea of you all coming together and and healing the the house because I think it's um it's very exciting and congratulate you on what you've done so far and wish you all very very best wishes for the future and just can't wait to come and see it when it's done <laughs> thank you thank you very much well, thank, we'll thanks so later. much everybody really lovely okay. thank you thank you um, thanks, everybody, and many thanks to Savills and Druitts for making this event possible. Um, just a reminder, the Ainho Park sale is on the 20th to the 22nd of January. All the details are on the Druitts website. If you'd like to register for the sale or to find out more information, please contact them at housesales at druitts.com. And that's next Wednesday, for those that keep asking me. How was your walk <laughs> next week? Uh, it's next week.